as my cross you bore, so I could live in the freedom you died for. And now my life is yours, and I will sing of your goodness forever. You're the name. 
Good morning and welcome to BIC Online, Bondurant International Church. We are Waldemar and Rosemary Kowalski. And we are very delighted to be with you. We're delighted to serve as your pastors. Whether we've gotten to meet you in person or you're somebody who has joined us since this whole COVID thing hit. Right, and we're gonna to worship together. We've already had some music that we've sung to, that we worship God with, but prepare your hearts. We're gonna worship first um, with a song and then with uh, the opportunity to give. You have many, many ways that you can give back the favor that God has given you. And a little bit later, we're gonna talk about the Christmas offering that's coming up and other opportunities for generosity. But we just wanna say, BIC depends on your tithes and offerings to do the, the work that God has called us to do. So when the time comes, when that screen comes up after, after we've sung in worship, after the music, be generous and give from the heart. Nothing like your presence. I will sing of all your goodness. Where all my fears fade to praise. Say, Savior, Savior, there is nothing like your freedom. Dancing with the hope of heaven. Where all my fears fade to praise. All I want.
Okay, remember what these are? These are our Advent bags, and they are coming in the week of November 21st. So, for all those who are near BIC and consider themselves members of BIC, we have an Advent bag with for you with fine going from the neighborhood because we're going to be giving back to the neighborhood. And there's an Advent, there are Advent candles with a special Advent holder provided by Ruth. And as always, one of the favorites. Cookies, yes. Home-baked Christmas. Home-baked Christmas cookies for y'all. And a devotional. So it's a bag of goodies, but we need to know where you live for delivery, or else you can come and pick it up at Green Gate during the week of November 21st. Please do contact our office at communitybic at gmail.com and talk to Alice about how she'll deliver it to you or how you want to pick that up, all right? Don't forget. <laughs> our Old Testament reading this morning is from 2 Kings chapter 5. Now, Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he sent to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servant said to, went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. The Naaman and all his attendants went back to the name of the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, said Naaman, Please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other god but the Lord. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Rimon to bow down and he is leaning on my arm and I have to bow there also, when I bow down in the temple of Rimon, May the Lord forgive your servant for this. Go in peace, Elisha said. Look for...
verse 14 to 30. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and the news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, and was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it, it, it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and proclaim the ear of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? they asked. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physicians, heal yourself, and you will tell me. Do hear in your hometown that we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly, I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in this hometown. Twenty, I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time. When the sky has shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land, yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but a widow, widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon, and there were many in Israel with leprosy. In the time of Elisha the prophet, yet no one of them was cleansed, only in Ammon and Syria. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which he, the town was built, in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Welcome to Bandung International Church Online. We're Waldemar and Rosemary Kowalski, the pastors. And let's start uh, with prayer as we will examine the word. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for this privilege to study your word together, to see what the stories in your scripture have to tell us and to teach us. And today, as we examine the activity of your Holy Spirit in a foreign place or over a foreign person through a child, we just thank you that we can come to you and learn. Settle our hearts today and help us to engage with you, we pray. Amen. Amen. So we are delighted to serve as your pastors. Today, we continue the stories of the prophets who spoke for God to the people. We've heard several exciting stories about Elijah, about God providing for him, and then his and God's great triumph over the prophets of Baal. Last week, we heard about Elisha. Elijah had mentored Elisha, and Elisha had a final request of Elijah. And remember, of course, J comes before S, so that's Elijah. And then his follower, the one he was mentoring was Elisha. Elisha asked for a double portion of God's spirit. He saw Elijah taken up to heaven. And when he did, Elisha tore his robe as a sign of mourning. He picked up the cloak that had fallen from Elijah when he went up into heaven. And if you remember that story, that's about the fiery chariot and the horses that take him cool up to heaven. It's a very cool story in 2 Kings 2. Well, Elisha went back to the river that he and his mentor had crossed, and he rolled up his mentor's cloak and struck the water. And it parted for him, just as it had for Elijah. This was the beginning of many, many miracles that Elisha would perform. You know, that double portion is not the student saying to the teacher, I'd like to be twice as smart as you or twice as powerful. Rather, that always referred to inheritance in that culture because the oldest child would receive twice as much as any other child. 
And so what Elisha is doing is he's asking to inherit the ministry of Elijah. Now, it's interesting that the Bible does record twice as many miracles for Elisha as it does for Elijah. And some people read that and think, oh, yeah, Elisha is asking to be greater than Elijah. That's not what Elisha is asking for. He wants to continue the work of his mentor, his spiritual father. So last week, Ron Weinbaum talked to us about God's abundant provision, his abundanza. I guess that's a great Italian word. <laughs> to and through Elisha. There are two stories about a woman who longs for a child. She's not poor and she's not a widow, but she is childless. All her money can't provide what she desperately wants. So Elisha prophesies and she becomes pregnant and has a son. When the boy is young, he might have been four or five years old, he dies. Well, the woman goes directly to Elisha and asks, why did God give me a child only to take him away? Well, it does take a little bit more than simply saying, get up for the boy to come back from the dead. But in the end, the mother rejoices. Her son lives. And then there is another story. Many years later, this mother and her family who've left that area because of drought tells her story to the king of that time and her property and its income are restored to her. And there are other miracles of provision in Elisha's stories. A poisonous stew becomes healthy, and then a hundred men are fed with what seems like much too little bread with food left over. Yeah, that would be a familiar story for those who know the stories of Jesus. Yeah. Well, today we come to Naaman's story. Naaman is the army commander in Aram, and he's a man of power and authority. Well, in Aram, the Arameans are enemies of Israel, but there's a truce at this time. <laughs> Excuse me. They live just to the north in what is Syria today. So Naaman, um, Commander Naaman, has leprosy. It's a bacterial disease where parts of the body become infected and damaged. And all the might of Naaman and all the goodwill of his king cannot help him in his illness. And in Naaman's story, it's a Jewish slave girl who has a solution. And as Rosemary had said, this is the story of the Holy Spirit working through a little girl. She tells her mistress that the God of Israel can heal through the prophet Elisha. And again, we see the importance of women to God. Have you noticed how often Elijah and Elisha demonstrate how God takes care of widows, of childless women? You know, in our society, human society, the strong and the powerful are favored. God doesn't work that way. We see the importance of young people, of women in God's plan. God cares for them. They have a meaningful role. Well, the king of Aram agrees that Naaman should go to Israel to be healed. So to whom will he appeal? Of course, he goes right to the top and sends gifts and letters to the king of Israel rather than to Elisha. He tells the king, okay, this is, this is a letter from one king to another. Cure Naaman. Uh-oh. <laughs> the king of Israel is dismayed. He thinks the king of Aram is trying to pick a fight with him. After all, the Israelite king cannot cure leprosy. Well, Elisha hears of this, hears that the king of Israel has torn his robes and is stressed out. Now, remember, it was the Jewish slave girl who knew that it was the prophet who has the answer. The king apparently doesn't know what the slave girl knows. But Elisha sends a message to the king, hey, have that guy come over here. He'll learn that there is actually a prophet in Israel. And so Naaman goes over to Elisha's house. Well, Elisha isn't impressed by this guy. He doesn't even come out of his house to see him. Instead, he orders his messenger to, uh, he sends a messenger out and tells him, go dip in the Jordan River seven times. Well, that's pretty insulting. <laughs> At least Elisha could have talked to this powerful man in person, but no. Naaman is expecting something more spectacular, arm waving, you know, something really impressive. Well, Naaman doesn't know that he's dealing with God, the real thing, not a fake magician like, <clears throat> oh, a Harry Potter or something like that. Besides the lack of a show by Elisha, the Jordan is not as nice as the rivers back home. Naaman would rather bathe in them than in the Jordan. 
But his servants talked to him, look, this is a simple thing. He's not demanding a lot of you, just do it. And then, so he does. He's cleansed and he's healed of leprosy. And indeed, there is a prophet in Israel. And there is a God of power working through that prophet. Naaman returns to Elisha's house. He confesses his faith in God and offers a prophet a gift because he truly is thankful. He's brought stuff along, he's ready, and it's a big gift. While Elisha refuses, God and his healing can't be bought. And Elisha isn't interested in money. That's not why he's in this thing. So Naaman asks for a different favor on a completely different scale. He wants to take two mule loads, so he wants to pack up his two mules with earth from Israel. And he says, on them, I'm gonna build an altar and it'll be as though I'm worshiping God here. I wanna worship your God. So can I take two sacks of, of earth along? Well, of course, that's, he doesn't wanna worship the gods he's worshiped before. Yeah, and he does explain to Elisha that because he is the king of Aram's right-hand man, he will have to accompany his king into the temple of Rimon, the god of his king, when the king worships there. And he asks whether he can be forgiven for this. And Elisha tells him, go in peace. And so he leaves for home. Yeah, but Gehazi, Elisha's servant, runs after Naaman after he's left. He's trying to be sneaky. He's greedy for the wealth that Naaman has offered. Elisha knows exactly what's going on. Elisha curses Gehazi for his greed and his family becomes sick with leprosy. Oof. Naaman is cured. Gehazi now has the leprosy. Ouch. <laughs> yeah, ooh. Well, Elisha is working as a prophet for about 60 years. And later on, the king of Aram goes to war with the king of Israel. But God intervenes through Elisha. There's going to be a famine for seven years, which ends with God's miraculous provision. A new king named Jehu kills all of Ahab's family, including his widow Jezebel and the ministers of Baal. So Elisha serves good kings and bad kings, and eventually he's near the end of his life. And on Elisha's deathbed, jo Jehoash, and so many names are somewhat similar, Jehoash, who's the king at the time, makes a request of Elisha. God again answers miraculously and brings deliverance from the enemies. You can read about this in 2 Kings 13. God gives a final prophecy and direction for the future through Elisha. Now you need to know, Jehoash is an evil king, but Elisha does not withhold God's blessing and provision for Israel. The cool thing is, Elisha is one of our good guys. He ran his race well. He's faithful in serving God. He's faithful in caring for God's people in good times as well as bad, for good people as well as bad. Ah, oh, what a lesson for us. Well, in today's New Testament reading, Jesus recounts stories of both Elijah and Elisha. He it tells a story of how God cares for outsiders, including Naaman. God's servants serve not only God's own people. From the beginning, it's ha it has been God's intention to bless every nation and all people. Elisha is willing to heal an outsider. He's willing to do whatever God wants him to do, no matter who God is blessing. We want to ask you, are you willing to be the means of blessing for everyone around you? <sighs> In the story we heard, what if this person later sends an army against your own people? The king of Aram would attack Israel in the next generation. God still healed the king of Aram's army captain. So are there limits to the love of God? Should you love even those who may be a threat to you? Hmm, what a question. Well, as we come near to Advent, which starts on November the 28th, so in three weeks, Three weeks, right? Yeah. Ah, oh, the pre-Christmas season is where we look forward to God's great gift for us. So let's think about the God who loves and gives life. He gave Jesus into a world where people wanted to harm him, to kill him even as a baby. 
Jesus lives a life that demonstrates his faithfulness to the Father and shows the Father's provision for everyone. Now, as Rosemary mentioned, did you catch that Elisha's feeding of a hundred would later be echoed by Jesus' feedings of thousands? Yeah. yeah. Wow. And Jesus completes his work on earth by dying on the cross. He provides our salvation. In fact, he is the perfect sacrifice for all our sins. And that sacrifice is not just for those who love him, for the insiders, for his disciples. In fact, Jesus said on the cross, Father, forgive them. Those were the people who were crucifying him. Forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. So we want to, to challenge you today to expand your circle. <laughs> as Elijah and Elisha show us, as Jesus demonstrated, let's love those who need God's help. Oh yeah, the Bible does say we need to take care of our family and those of the household of faith. But you know what? We are created to reflect God, to shine out his love into a world that needs him. Our Christmas offering this year is for our neighbors in need, for those who know our God and those who do not know him. When you think at the end of this year, it has been a hard year for many people. Here in Indonesia, we're just starting to open back up. And uh, whether you're an international, whether you're living in Indonesia or you're not, whether you're a local person, an Indonesian from another island or wherever you're from, if you're, a, if you're a hometown person, we're going to invite you to be part of the special Christmas offering. And, and donations will be accepted for that through the end of the year. But the special offering is for this. Our leadership team has said, look at all the needs around us. We don't have to have special great projects. What we need to do is take care of our neighbors. So there's a giving link posted. And if you wanna do a screenshot or something to give later, you're welcome to do that. But would you consider the generosity of God in sharing his good life and his good news with you and pass that on in a very real way. We'll be, we'll be giving that to the needy at the very beginning of the new year. So <laughs> Jesus says, look, there are so many people with leprosy in Israel uh, in his day, but only Naaman was healed of leprosy, an outsider. So God yeah. gives his good gifts to everyone, not just insiders. And you know what? Not everybody will be healed. But God's highest goal for you is your holiness, your wholeness in every sense, not just physical healing. I think the most wonderful part of the story is not that Naaman is healed, but that he takes the earth back and builds an altar to the true God. And we want to serve that God. God, we thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you that as we saw in this story, that we can admit that we need help as Naaman did as his king requested and come seeking your help. We can choose to believe in you. Even though he stuttered a bit in his belief, in the end, Naaman does believe and he does commit he does do what the prophet has said. He does go into the River Jordan. And his, his reward for that is not just physical healing, but he gets to know you, the yes. one true God. And I pray for everybody watching. You, you know our needs. In our story today, there were needs of healing. There are needs of provision, the food that was provided by Elisha and by Jesus. There, there are needs of salvation. And I pray that you would bring that to all those who are in need of it. Rosemary and I pray for that today. Amen. Amen. And if you want to know what it takes to follow Jesus, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, we always say a simple ABC. Because admit. it's just easy to remember. We admit. We believe. Well, what do we admit? Oh, we admit that we know, <laughs> that we need help, yeah, that we can't that do it on our solution. own. Yeah, right. Absolutely. That God has provided something. We believe, B, that God sent his son for us, that he is for us, 
that he has taken the burden of our sin, everything that keeps us from, uh, from loving God with all our hearts and caring for other people. He's put that on the cross of Jesus Christ. So we believe that God has provided a solution for us. And see? We commit. We do things. We follow him. We, we don't obey God. We don't do stuff you know, because we're trying to earn his favor. We already got that. He's already given us everything. We do it because we love him. And one of our acts of commitment is what we're going to be doing now. Yeah, Jesus instituted the rit a ritual of the church, the sacrament of the church that we do every Sunday. And that is called communion, which celebrates the last supper of Jesus with his disciples. And so would you... We're going to take a little break. Just put, put this on pause. Grab something to drink and something to eat. If you're a follower of Jesus or if you intend to start following Jesus today, come celebrate that with us. So we now celebrate Christ's provision of healing and of salvation, which are features of a number of the stories we have told as we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. All who have received salvation and forgiveness for sins, everyone who wants to do that is welcome to join us now as we celebrate what Christ did for us. Paul says these words, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So please take your bread and eat together with us. His body broken for us. Thank you, God, how grateful we are. Mm -hmm. How grateful we are that you allowed your body to be broken for our healing. Thank yes. you, God. Just thank you this morning for, for the opportunity to eat with my brothers and sisters. In the same way after supper, take something to drink. In the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Please take your cup and drink with us. His blood shed for us. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for being willing to come to those who don't love you, don't know you, mm -hmm. being willing to live and to die for us, for that broken body, for that shed blood, for the salvation, for the healing, for restoration, for all of these things, we thank you for your good gifts. Amen. Amen. And here's the collector closing prayer. Grant us, O Lord, to trust in you with all our hearts, you always resist the proud who confide in their own strength, but you never forsake those who are humble. Seek you and make their boast of your mercy. Take the clay of our lives and shape it to love. Take the clay of the church and shape it to grace. Take the clay of the world and shape it to peace. Take the clay of today and shape it to hope, and then breathe your spirit into all again forever and ever, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Thank you for joining us. Thanks to everyone who served us this morning and served with us. As we close, join us for some closing worship songs. This is not just an add-on. This is our response to God, a time when we open our hearts to worship God in response for what we've heard and for what we've promised him. So let God speak to you through the words and the music. But first, here's a benediction to send you into the week. Hear the words of Jesus as we look forward to celebrating his coming into the world. If you love me, 
then listen to my voice and do what I say. And I and my father will draw close to you and will make our home within you. I am leaving you with a gift, a gift the world cannot give. Peace of heart and mind. So do not let your heart be troubled or afraid. Let us go from here to love and serve the Lord, confident in the peace that Christ offers to each one of us. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. 
You came into the world you created, trading your crown for a cross. You willingly died. You really sun life paid the cost. Counting your status as nothing. The king of all kings came to serve. Washing my feet, covering me with your love. In my view, means less of me. Take everything. Yes, all of you is all I need. Take everything. And my treasure, the one that I can't live without. Here at your feet, my desires and dreams start to break down. Here at your feet, my desires and dreams are laid. Take me like home.